Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Multiplex Precision Genome Editing with Trackable Genome Integrated Barcodes and Yeast. Presented by Dr. Kevin Roy, Postdoctoral Scholar, Department of Genetics, Stanford University. I am Kaylee Bach of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type your questions into the drop-down box, and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Roy. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Great, thank you, Kaylee. It's a Pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to pr present my work today, and I wanted to thank the Lab Roots organizers for the invitation and um, for putting on this uh, really useful online conference. Uh, my name is Kevin Roy, and I'm a National Research Council postdoctoral associate with the Genome Scale Measurements Group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST, as well as uh, jointly with the Stanford Genome Technology Center at the Stanford University School of Medicine. And today it's my pleasure to present our work on adapting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to a large-scale precision editing platform um, with an added uh, feature of, of incorporating trackable genomic barcodes as part of the editing process. And so CRISPR is, has come on over the last five years as a really useful, scalable platform because it's uh, simple in nature. It's a two-component system that includes a protein nuclease, uh, the common, most common one known as Cas9. And the real a powerful feature is that the guide RNA to which it binds can be programmed to target nearly any genomic sequence. And the, uh, the applications are very broad for being able to, to target uh, DNA cleavage in virtually any cell, and these span from biofuels and biotechnology to uh, medicine and, and potentially uh, precision uh, editing for therapies, as well as in pharmaceuticals and drug, drug development. But the, the main application I'd like to focus on today is the uh, enormous uh, utility for this technology in basic scientific research and understanding how cells work and in modifying uh, DNA sequence at a large scale to test different hypotheses about the function of the cell. And so it's good to take a step back when using the system to understand how it evolved and what it, has, what it really uh, does at its core level. And so the, the CRISPR system was discovered initially as a, a group of genes that function in a related pathway as part of a viral DNA immunity uh, response. <clears throat> So upon infection um, of, of a bacterial cell by a virus, the, there is a complex of, of proteins uh, composed of Cas1 and Cas2 that are known as the integrase complex that interrogate the viral DNA and um, incorporate segments of this viral DNA into the bacterial genome in this locus known as the CRISPR locus, uh, which was originally um, interesting because of its repetitive nature interspaced by uh, these uh, spacer sequences corresponding to viral DNA. And so this is just the beginning of the process. This is the immunization phase. Once these uh, viral DNA segments are incorporated into this repeat segment, the bacterial genome is transcribed uh, into RNA, and this RNA is then processed by the bacterial uh, host cell enzymes into individual repeat spacer fragments, which are then bound by the protein Cas9. And so it's important 
in the context of an Im immune system that the main function of this system, the protein RNA nuclease, is to cut viral DNA with high efficiency. And in many cases, it's not that critical uh, whether or not there's a, a mutation in the viral genome at the target site. All that matters is that the bacterial uh, immune system doesn't cut its own genome and only cuts the viral DNA. So that's an important consideration uh, later on when we're thinking of designing donor DNAs that will introduce uh, small changes to the sequence. And so the, the important aspect about this system is that the, the targeting sequence is short and reprogrammable. So the Cas9 bound guide RNA is shown in red and blue here from five prime to three prime. And the red sequence solely functions to bind tightly to the Cas9 protein. The sequence in blue can actually be reprogrammed to target any desired sequence. The only restriction is that it be adjacent to what's known as the protospacer adjacent motif, a PAM, in the case of Cas9 and GG. Upon reprogramming these guide RNAs, the Cas9 guide RNA complex will scan the genome for the target site that has a PAM, and it will then introduce two cuts, uh, typically a blunt end cut, three base pairs upstream from the PAM. And so again, it's important to note that the Cas9 guide RNA complex, all, all it does is cut the genome in, at, at a site and create a double-strand break. What's really important in the context of gene editing is what happens after. And so there are three main possible outcomes of the double-strand break. The first one is non-homologous end joining, where a complex of proteins will recognize the broken ends and simply put the pieces back together. Occasionally, an error is made in this process, and that error will actually render the target DNA resistant to further cutting. Uh, the, the error is typically uh, an insertion or a deletion of a few nucleotides, but the main point here is that it's somewhat non-deterministic, the outcome. And so this process is mainly used to disrupt sequences, in particular open reading frames. A second outcome is cell death because the, the cleavage process itself is slightly toxic and depending on the cell state at the time of cleavage, the cells will undergo apoptosis. The third outcome, which is preferable in many systems, is homology-directed repair. And this utilizes the cell's endogenous system to repair a sequence using, uh, in many cases, the homologous chromosome. Um, or in the case of gene editing, an exogenous um, segment of DNA, which we call the donor DNA. And so in this pathway, the sequences flanking the break must be perfectly homologous to the donor DNA for a given stretch for the editing to occur efficiently. And the outcome of this process is a precise change, which is defined um, in the donor DNA, which can be very useful for um, changing amino acids uh, to particular uh, substitution sequences or changing binding sites to a particular um, specific site. And so what's important to look to think about is actually under the hood of this process of cutting and repair are many cycles of perfect repair. And so it's not, it's not clear exactly how many cycles occur before an endpoint is reached, which an endpoint is either the NHEJ cell death or HDR editing. Um, but this is an ongoing process so that the cell does not always repair um, the cut with a change. In many cases, it will repair it perfectly and it'll get cut again. And so if we take a step back and look at what are the, the important developments in biosciences, which have enabled a, a deeper understanding of this, how the whole cell functions, we've had a, an enormous revolution in uh, measure, high throughput measurement technology, starting with measuring DNA, RNA, the proteome, metabolites, and lipids at a large scale, where we can measure many components at once. And we've also had technologies that enable perturbing many parts of the cell at the same time, 
And these include mutagenesis randomly through chemical methods or, or radiation methods, uh, genetic methods to induce knockout collections um, by synthetic genetic arrays to, to um, combine knockouts uh, at a large scale, um, and, and more scalable methods for performing screens in a pool format include the RNA interference, and more recently, CRISPR interference, as well as CRISPR cutting utilizing the NHEJ pathway. But the limitation of all these perturbation approaches is that they are primarily probing the function of genes by either changing the expression levels up or down, or by completely knocking out function. And while that's useful, we still lack robust tools for introducing precise sequence changes utilizing donor DNA as opposed to utilizing NHEJ. And you can think of it as the difference between um, a search and replace function in your word processor that simply allows you to delete uh, specific words and randomly get some sort of outcome from that, or being able to add in uh, a, a replace text that precisely allows you to change one word to another all throughout a document. And that's what we're looking for with a system um, that utilizes donor DNA at a large scale. So in order to implement this system, we've utilized oligonucleotide array synthesis. And the benefit of, the, of this format of uh, DNA synthesis is that it allows us to synthesize thousands to hundreds of thousands of individual sequences all together on a single slide. And these sequences are designed on the computer and uh, essentially printed onto glass slides. And after the sequences are, are, are printed, they are actually washed off and pooled all together into the same tube. And the advantage is that it allows one to, to um, process many samples in a multiplexed fashion without having to have thousands of individual tubes. And so what, what our method incorporates into this process is the inclusion of the guide sequence and the donor sequence on the same DNA molecule. These sequences are separated, shown in red here, by a restriction, a restriction site and flanked by common priming sites. The, the amplification of these oligonucleotides is accompanied by the inclusion of a barcode on the reverse primer. This barcode is important because it allows us to tag each guide donor that is cloned with a unique um, 30 mer in this case, sequence. And what we can then do is, is sequence this intermediate clone uh, plasmid library, utilizing primers that flank the barcode and the guide, and obtain uh, high, high quality um, sequences using um, next generation sequencing where we associate each guide and donor with a specific barcode. And this is important because the oligonucleotide synthesis process occasionally introduces errors into the guide and the donor. So for any given guide donor sequence, uh, a large fraction of them, any, up, upwards of uh, 40 to 50%, will contain errors. And we need to be able to distingu distinguish those errors from the sequence perfect molecules. And the barcode allows us to do that, and it also allows us to track each strain by sequencing just the small barcode as opposed to the entire guide donor sequence. So this is just an intermediate step of cloning. The next step involves inserting the, the guide RNA scaffold, which is necessary to bind Cas9, shown in, in red, as well as uh, yeast and bacterial markers. So this platform, we've uh, initially optimized it using the yeast system as a model eukaryote. And so we take the uh, this is called the step two plasmid library, and we transform this into the yeast cells which harbor Cas9, either inducible or a pre-expressed form of, of Cas9. So after transforming this guide donor library, we, we induce Cas9 in the guide, and what this, uh, what this does is it produces an edit at the target site. And on this guide donor plasmid, we also have a second guide RNA, which actually targets this uh, the, own, the, the same plasmid from which it's expressed, the guide donor plasmid. And this guide RNA also targets a specific engineered site in the genome, which we call the barcode locus. And what this effectively does is it 
integrates the entire guide donor cassette stably into the genome. Um, and at the same time, it linearizes the, the guide donor plasmid to produce a superior homologous recombination template to produce the editing. So at the end of this process, we have the integrated guide donor barcode, as shown on the left. And on the right, we have the specific variant allele, which can be introduced throughout the genome and mediated by the donor DNA on the plasmid. And so we call this system Majestic, which stands for Multiplexed Accurate Genome Editing with Short Trackable Integrated Cellular Barcodes. And this, I want to emphasize the, the multiplex nature of the system <clears throat> in that we're not just producing one edit at a time, we're producing thousands of edits at a time. And, but we start with a population of cells that's otherwise isogenic or the same, and we, we deposit a, a desired edits throughout the genome. And each edit is accompanied with its own specific barcode. And the barcode, the first purpose of the barcode, again, is to distinguish the perfect guide donors from those that contain errors. And the second purpose of the barcode is to enable us to grow this population of cells in many different conditions under which these different genetic variants uh, impart differential fitness impacts to those cells. And by doing this uh, pooled growth, in these different conditions, and we can, and compared to the reference condition, we can gain an understanding and gain an understanding of how these specific genetic variants impact fitness. And the the way we do that is by simply counting the barcodes using next generation sequencing. And so, as a proof of principle for this approach, we. We edited a gene called AD2, which is a gene required for adenine biosynthesis. And this gene is often used uh, in, in yeast editing because it provides a simple readout of the editing result, which is a red color of the cell um, due to the accumulation of a pigment uh, intermediate in the adenine biosynthesis pathway. And so first what we did was we, we cloned a representative plasmid which contains an AD2 guide and donor and it transformed this plasmid into a cell which contains an inducible form of Cas9. So we can induce Cas9 simply by a, a metabolic shift from glucose to galactose. And over the course of 15 generations, we can take time points of the, the edited population and sequence the target edit to see what's actually happening. Um, are we actually producing the desired edit? And what you can see here is initially we start with 100% wild type sequence and over five generations, that, that sequence drops towards zero, and we get uh, an increase in the sequence of in the, in the sequences that represent perfect donor repair. Uh, but in this system, <clears throat> we also see considerable NHEJ um, indels at the target site, and these reach roughly 20 to 25 percent by the end of the editing process. At the same time, we can introduce these barcodes um, by co-expressing these two guide RNAs, guide X, as we call it, and the, the add to guide. And the, the integrated barcode, we can assay using PCR across the barcode locus, and it shows us an increased size migration here. And the, the recipient site at the beginning just contains this counter-selectable FCY1 marker uh, which contains a lower size. So we can see over the course of uh, five to seven generations, we're reaching near complete integration of this barcode. And by nine to 11, it's essentially complete. And we've done this also uh, with, with a complex pool in addition to the single add to guide donor plasmid and these show similar uh, barcode integration kinetics. What we can also do is look at how efficient the destruction of the guide donor plasmid is in this process. So as it's integrated into the genome, this guide donor plasmid is also cut. Uh, and that cutting linearizes the plasmid and, and renders it unable to be replicated further. So it essentially is self-destructed in this process. And we can see that the loss of the guide donor plasmid um, essentially levels off around nine generations. It's nearly completely lost. And so <clears throat> we can also perform these experiments in cells that cannot 
perform NHEJ using a mutation in the NEJ1 gene. And this allows us to completely get rid of the, the undesirable editing um, that's due to the random insertion deletions from NHEJ. And here we can obtain 100% uh, precision editing using the donor DNA. And so another way of looking at the barcode integration is to see how, how, much of, how much of the clones have removed the FCY1 marker at the barcode locus. And initially, we see very little survival on the 5FC, which counter selects against FCY1. And over five to 10 generations, we see the survival approach 100% with very little change. So this indicates that <clears throat> Indeed, we have integrated these markers into the genome, and the advantage is that the, the barcode being stably integrated is no longer needed to be maintained on a plasmid. And so we can grow the cells in any, any condition without having to keep selection for the plasmid. And so in the course of this work, we found that while editing in Galactose is able to produce high levels of precision editing, up to 80%, in the presence of NHEJ, which can be pushed to 100% in the absence of NHEJ, when the editing is done in glucose with constitutive Cas9 and guide, with either the guide donor express first or the Cas9 express first, we were really surprised to find that NHEJ was not observed whether or not NEJ1 is present. And so this indicates that the metabolic state of the cell or, or the precise conditions under which Cas9 and the guide are induced can have a profound impact on the editing process itself. And another thing to keep in mind in this process is that editing is very toxic and roughly 10% or less of cells actually survive the process. So this is a representative experiment where we're transforming an ad 2 guide donor plasmid on the left or an equivalent amount of guide donor plasmid that contains a mutated guide RNA. And you can see uh, the huge difference in colony numbers after the transformation process, indicating that on the left, many of the cells that actually receive this plasmid and cut the genome don't survive the editing process. And so in a multiplex setting, what, what you can now simulate is what will happen when we have guide donor sequences that contain mutations or guides that, guides that don't function well. And so if we spike in these plasmids in a simulation of a library at 1% or 10%, we see that by, by 10%, the number of white colonies here, which represent the mutated guide donor, are already beginning to dominate the, the colonies that contain the guide donor, um, the functional guide donor. And so this is a problem for screens because we have most of the cellular population not producing an edit, and it will just it will increase the the size of the screen as well as lower the efficiency of finding va genetic variants of interest. So, in order to address this issue, we developed a system to improve the survival of the editing process by actively recruiting the donor DNA to the site of the breaks, and we use a system that yeast naturally use to repair. Uh, double strand breaks at the mating type locus, and we adapted it for the guide donor editing. And the system involves the pro a protein called FKH1. And in order to adapt it to guide donor editing, we fused the Lexa, a Lexa DNA binding domain to the C terminus of this protein. And we then can introduce Lexa binding, uh, binding sites adjacent to the donor sequence on the plasmid and what this allows us to do is target this FKH1 protein to the plasmid. Then we can induce editing, create the double strand break. And what happens when the double strand breaks are created are that a signaling cascade is induced where threonine residues on various proteins are phosphorylated. And the, the exact identity of these, pro of these proteins that are phosphorylated and bound by FKH1 is still under investigation, but it includes among others, MPH1, a helicase involved in DNA repair, and FDO1. And so what, what the end result of this process of binding to the phosphothreonines and the LexA sites 
is to recruit this donor DNA directly to the cut site. And it's important to keep in mind that the genome is a very vast place for DNA. There's millions of base pairs in yeast and in human cells, billions of base pairs. And in the DNA repair process, the cell has the enormous challenge of finding a stretch of 50 to 100 bases of identical sequence amidst millions to billions of, of competitor sequence. So this process of donor recruitment greatly simplifies the search for a suitable um, template for repair. And so we, as a proof of principle, we implemented the system on the add to editing. Uh, in this case, utilizing 15% uh, spiking of a non-functional plasmid. So the non-functional plasmid gives rise to these white colonies, whereas the functional add to guide donor gives rise to the red colonies. And you can see that the plates, uh, the transformations that lack either the Lex A sites or the Lex A forkhead protein or, or both produce mostly white colonies, but when we combine both Lexa sites and the Lexa 4 kid fusion protein, we now see a dramatic shift in the uh, fraction of edited cells. And so we can represent this by count, actually just counting the fraction of red colonies versus uh, white colonies, and we can see a greater than five-fold increase in the uh, efficiency of homologous recombination in this process. And what's even more dramatic is that uh, the ratio of, of red colonies to white colonies is now approaching the spike in ratio. So we're reaching near, nearly 65 to 70 percent, whereas the spike in ratio is roughly is 85 percent of the add to guide donor plasmid. And again, remarkably, the presence or absence of NHEJ does not appear to have an impact in this process when we are editing with a constitutive Cas9 system in the presence of glucose. And so one of the concerns might be that we, we don't yet know if all the red colonies are actually producing the, the designed edits that we introduced into the donor DNA. So what we can do now is sequence the, the add to um, targeted locus and check to see what the sequence matches. And so here what you can see is that uh, in the absence of the donor recruitment system, which are the, far, the, the three left columns, uh, we see mostly wild type sequence, which corresponds to the white colonies on the plate, whereas we see only a small fraction of edited sequence due to the donor DNA. Now in the presence of the donor recruitment system, we see that uh, the donor e editing sequences rise to 50%, which is slightly less than the uh, 65 to 70 percent we see here, and that's because the all of the red colonies are actually smaller due to the growth defect that's introduced. So they contribute proportionally less uh, sequence reads. So if we if we zoom in on the very minor fraction of of reads that don't correspond to wild type and donor, we do see a very minimal level of, of NHEJ in the system. So it's on the order of um, 0.5 percent or less. <clears throat> and we can see that even using, utilizing the donor recruitment uh, does decrease the level of NHEJ, and we see a very small fraction of cells that incorporate um, only partially the sequence change from this donor DNA, which we call an imperfect donor repair. So we wanted to then take this editing system to a larger scale, um, and what, there are multiple applications where we might want to edit many different sites across the genome or across a gene. And one case would be to understand the function of all amino acids, for example, in a protein. And for a while, we had worked on a, on a protein involved in lipid signaling called SEC14. And this was particularly interesting to us because <clears throat> it is a promising drug target for pathogenic fungi, and it's the target of a small molecule that binds it very specifically. So we thought that by editing the SEC14 um, open reading frame exhaustively, we could identify mutations that are important for the protein function, as well as that mediate resistant, increased resistance or sensitivity uh, to the small molecule drug that binds it. And so the strategy that we took was to design guide RNA and donor DNA uh, pairs where the, the donor DNA introduces an amino acid substitution 
but also includes some synonymous mutations adjacent to that substitution, which are designed to prevent the guide RNA from cutting the donor DNA. So if we go back to the, um, to the earlier slide where we, we showed that the CRISPR immune system mainly has evolved to cut, donor, to cut the viral DNA with a high efficiency. It's important to keep in mind that when we have donor DNA that's very close, uh, has a close resemblance to the actual target sequence, it is possible that a mismatch or two, or in this case three, will still be cleaved by the guide RNA. So to, to prevent that from happening in this uh, design, we actually can include these synonymous changes shown in blue, which will prevent, um, completely prevent the cutting of the donor DNA. So in order to address the concern that these synonymous changes have potentially have some effect on their own, we include a control where we have only the synonymous changes on top, and, and below that we include the synonymous changes with the desired variant change. And we can then introduce every uh, amino acid substitution with either upstream synonymous changes or downstream synonymous changes and two different guide RNAs in each case. And at the end, compare the results of these different uh, genetic variants to see if they agree. And so as SEC14 is an essential gene, we, we wanted to make sure that we were making all of the edits that we designed without having to be concerned about the effect of the edits on the protein function. And so the approach we took was to utilize genetic suppression of the SEC14 um, deletion. And these are these suppressors are, are in the KES1 or CKI1 genes. So what that means is if we have a cell that lacks CKI1 or KES1, those cells will tolerate loss of function mutations in SEC14. So we can do the editing in the haploid suppressor background where SEC14 is not essential, then we can mate the, that library of edited cells to the uh, complementary suppressor, in this case, the CKI1 SEC14 delta. And what, what we'll get at the end of that process is a diploid cell that contains CK, CKI1 and KES1, which renders SEC14 essential, but only has one copy of SEC14, which is derived from the library. So this allows us to look at the haploid population of the of the SEC14 guide donors that are edited first, and then after mating to the diploid, we can then uh, examine the distribution of of uh, variants and make conclusions about the fitness effects of these variants. So, what we're showing here are the, the sequencing of the edited SEC14 region, and we are comparing the sequence counts for the designed variants. Um, in the diploid relative to the haploid. And this allows us to see, uh, again, the fitness effects of each of these variants. So we can see, immediately notice at the top, the premature termination codons that we introduce are, are depleted in the diploid, and that's due to the, the fact that this is an essential gene. So that was a really a good positive control. But now we can see um, specific amino acid substitutions that have dramatic fitness effects on this protein. And so one of the positions that jumps out, for example, is D115. And we can also see um, D115 doesn't tolerate many amino acid substitutions. And we can also see that for a region from P120 to F123, lysine or arginine, which are positively charged amino acids, are generally not tolerated in that region. And we can also see that proline, which is an amino acid that introduces a kink into the peptide backbone, is generally dis is largely disfavored at, in this region as well as in other, other positions throughout this um, portion of the protein. So what, what we could then do with this library is add this drug, which binds to SEC14, and then see how all of these different amino acid substitutions impact the uh, ability of the drug to bind to the protein. So when the drug binds to the protein, it in in inactivates the function of SEC14, and the cells die. So if mutations prevent the drug from binding, that will actually result in enhanced resistance to the drug relative to the wild type. Or if the mutations somehow um, enable or assist the drug in binding to the protein or compromise the function of the protein in the presence of the drug, 
that will result in enhanced sensitivity to the drug, and we will see uh, fewer reads for those for those uh, genetic variants. So here, what we're showing in on the bottom in blue uh, boxes are those amino acid substitutions that greatly enhance resistance to the drug. And so here, what's interesting is that we can see immediately um, one position jump out, Y111, where all amino acid substitutions that are not hydrophobic, so anything but phenylalanine, isoleucine, leucine, methionine, uh, or tyrosine, or tryptophan, or valine, tend to increase resistance. Uh, and we can also see a, a various other positions which show um, numerous substitutions that enhance resistance to the drug, including A104, P108, and P120. And so there are also various positions which enhance uh, sensitivity to the drug, shown in red. And so this allowed us to, to map these, these amino acid positions onto the, the known structure of the protein, and uh, as well as predict where the, the uh, computationally predict where the drug is probably binding the protein to obtain an, a deep understanding of how these amino acids um, interact with the drug in, in mediate SEC14 function. So Y111, for example, we can see in the lower left here, mediates a direct hydrophobic contact with the aromatic ring of this drug. And so many of these amino acid, um, resistant amino acid mutations, A104 and Y111 and Y122 are actually um, uh, van der Waals hydrophobic distances to bind to this drug. How many of the positions were actually not uh, predicted to directly bind the drug? And those are very interesting because they imply that there's um, some distance effects where there's some confirmation changes must occur in order for this drug to bind and that these mutations block potentially block those conformational changes. So as this was a screen done with thousands of different uh, genetic variants, we wanted to actually validate that the results of the screen and that this technology really is producing uh, accurate and precise results. So we took a few um, different amino acid substitutions shown, in, shown with asterisks in the lower left. And we recreated those individually, um, independently verified each edit, and grew them in separate cultures in the presence or absence of this drug. And what we found is that the results uh, very closely match what we see in the screen. So with regards to both the uh, direction of in resistance or sensitivity as well as the magnitude, um, we can see that L126, where we only see two uh, very resistant substitutions, E and C, both replicate in the validation experiment. And L126I was um, dramatically much more sensitive to the drug relative to the wild type. So this gave us confidence that the Majestic technology really is a powerful tool to, to look at thousands of different edits at the same time um, and give a, uh, a really rich profile of the function of protein sequence. And so we wanted to, to then take this to a, a broader application. Um, and the one we picked was to look at how genetic differences between individuals actually contribute to their phenotypes. And yeast is actually a very appropriate model for this because different strains of yeast across the world exhibit genetic differences much like uh, different people do in a population. And even more so, the actual fraction of genetic differences in the genome is roughly similar on the order of 0.1%. So one in a 1,000 base pairs uh, are different. And in, while it's mostly similar, we see that in, even in human populations, we have many different differences in disease susceptibility and how, how individuals are going to respond to treatments. And this is really the basis for the push for precision medicine, um, utilizing genomic sequence. And so what we can do is use yeast as a model to understand how do genetic differences actually control phenotypes. And in the past, this, this, this process was done using either segregant panels where genome sequences are shuffled, and by shuffling many different uh, genome sequences, by shuffling the sequences of two different parents 
at many different locations throughout the genome. Just using meiosis, we can obtain um, statistical uh, narrowing down of the regions that are correlate with a particular trait. Or in the case of natural populations, um, such as um, when we look at human genome sequences, we can do genome-wide association or GWAS studies where we obtain correlations between particular variants and a phenotype. Now, these approaches are powerful, but they're very limited because even at the, the most narrowing of, of these regions of statistical significance, there's typically hundreds to thousands of genetic variants in those positions. And so actually identifying the causative uh, nucleotides that are involved in these traits is, is very time consuming and very difficult. So we sought to turn this process on its head by introducing all of the genetic variants individually, initially into the same genetic background and using that process to understand in a one step experiment, what are the actual um, nucleotides or genetic variants that are responsible for a given trait. And so we first looked at two different strains um, that are commonly used in uh, evolutionary genetic studies. One is uh, the lab strain called S288C, another one RM11, which is a, wine, a wild wine strain. And these strains have very different um, traits uh, and phenotypes in response to different environmental conditions. And so if we look at what are the variants that we can actually target using the Cas9 guide RNA, it's roughly about 75%, uh, 70 to 75% of all the genetic variants can be targeted um, using the NGG PAM. And many of those can actually be targeted with two different guide RNAs. So we can utilize that for a little bit of redundancy. So we can design these libraries, clone them, and induce these edits um, at a large scale. So at the end, we get um, a very complex plasmid library that we, we can interrogate. We can integrate those barcodes into the genome when we produce the edits. And then we can sequence the barcodes. Now that the edits are all over the genome, we use the barcodes to understand how are the um, edits affecting cellular function. And in the beginning, how are we introducing these edits um, as a function of their toxicity. So we can look at the guides to understand how toxic the editing process is itself. So we can take advantage of the synthesis errors that are in the guide sequences. And here we call those dead if they're um, indels that are within the first 15 base pairs of the guide sequence or multiple SNPs. So we predict that these guides are not going to function. And what we can see is that during the editing process, these barcodes are enriched, as we might expect, because even in the even when we're using the donor recruitment system, the editing is still quite toxic. And so we can then uh, separate these guides into whether they're sequence perfect um, or near perfect or have a perfect donor as well. In addition to that, we've also characterized an important component of the guide sequence called the T-score, which is a metric of how how dense the uh, the number of T residues are, and we found that that actually has a significant negative impact on guide efficiency. So then, if we look at the, of the actual uh, sequence perfect guide sequences relative to the dead guide sequences, we can now see how the um, location of the SNP, which is the most common natural variant that we're introducing, relative to the PAM, impacts the editing toxicity in this case. So we can see that in, in what's called the seed region for the guide uh, within the first 10 bases from the PAM, there's roughly an equal distribution of abundance before and after editing. Um, but in the, in the distal PAM positions, we do see a dropout in the guide barcodes. And what this really indicates is that we're getting an additional toxicity above the editing process for these donor DNAs. And this, this is representative of the donor DNA being cleaved by the guide RNA in addition to the, the target site. And so if you recall that the CRISPR system evolved to cleave viral DNA with a high on-target efficiency, um, it did not evolve to be highly specific for uh, very, very similar sequences, especially when SNPs are, are, are far away from the seed sequence. 
And so this is an important consideration when using donor DNA to make edits is that when the, when the, the edit is far away from the cut site or the PAM, the chances of cleaving the donor DNA will increase. And those are edits that are going to be either um, impossible to make or will, will, will require uh, a different nuclease, perhaps a high-fidelity Cas9, for example, that will be less mismatch tolerant. And so we can then look among the sequence perfect guides at this um, T-score metric, which is a metric of the density of T residues. And the reason that's important is because a stretch of Ts will actually terminate transcription in eukaryotes, um, which use the Paul III promoter. And the Paul III promoter is the most commonly used uh, guide RNA promoter. So this is an important consideration when editing across the genome because many uh, regions which we want to edit are T-rich. And so this involves um, um, keeping that in consideration when attempting to edit uh, uh, genome-wide. And so we can compare uh, the guides as sorted by um, their T-score range versus the um, corresponding um, predicted scores from the Azimuth algorithm. And Azimuth is a uh, guide effectiveness predictive algorithm, which has proven to be very useful in many systems um, beyond yeast. And so we wanted to compare how well just, just incorporating the T-score alone compares to predicting effectiveness by azimuth. And you can see it does very similarly for lower T-score ranges, but with higher T-scores, the T-score alone appears to predict the effectiveness of these guides um, as well, or even slightly better than azimuth. And that's largely due to azimuth not being trained on uh, guides that have higher T-scores. And so to prove that the T-stretch actually impacts editing efficiency by reducing guide RNA abundance, we actually sequenced the entire population of guide RNAs and normalized their abundance relative to the guide DNA. And we classified the T-score um, based on the uh, the stretch of T's and whether or not they're interrupted by one or two nucleotides. So the interruption by a single nucleotide was given a penalty of 0.5 and two different nucleotides of non-T's were given a penalty of 2.5, for example. And what we found was that as the T-score uh, reaches five or higher, we see a dramatic drop in the guide RNA abundance. And so this, again, is an indication that utilizing uh, this T-score and guide RNA design will improve editing efficiency. We then picked random clones from this population to see what's actually happening at the target site when we try to edit genome-wide, not just in an open reading frame, but across the entire genome in subtelomeric regions, um, in non-coding regions, as well as open reading frames. So what we found is that if we segment the the 15 uh, clones we analyzed here by whether or not they have a uh, effective guide by the T-score metric, we, we can see that five of the guides had high T-scores and did not produce an edit as we expected. Now, of the guides that had uh, lower T-scores, meaning higher effectiveness, we noticed uh, six out of 10 produced the designed edit. And you can see these are indicated in the name of the guide sequence here. Um, and the donor with the SNP. So these are SNPs at position for anywhere from one to five from the PAN for this library. And so um, we've, uh, this work has recently been accepted in Nature Biotechnology. And so it will soon be online to, um, for all the viewers to look at further. But this was uh, an important point for us because we wanted to we wanted to understand why we're producing the edits um, when we are and why in some cases we're not. So that's the, the next stage of this project going forward is to really characterize efficiency at a broader level. So relative to other guide donor systems that are um, in use, I wanted to just show a few comparisons as we wrap up. And so all of these other systems use the guide donor or the donor as the barcode, and it's difficult to distinguish synthesis from sequencing errors when you do that. Um, plas all of these other systems utilize plasmid-based barcodes, so they're not genome integrated, and this requires constant selection. 
And the Cas9 brakes are repaired passively by homologous recombination without donor recruitment. So the Majestic system has several advantages. We have the barcoding step distinguishes synthesis from sequencing errors. We integrate these plasma barcodes into the genome. So they're stable and they, uh, they don't need to maintain any selection so we can grow the cells in any condition. And we have a process of active donor recruitment which increases the precision editing efficiency and we, we are excited to, uh, by the prospect that this system could be utilized in other cell lines, um, potentially even human cells to improve editing where uh, NHEJ is very prevalent. And the other, I think, major takeaway is that the exact conditions of editing, um, so not just Cas9 in the guide, but the, the exact metabolic state of the cell and the induction kinetics of Cas9 in the guide can have a substantial impact on the outcome of editing. And so this is something we're on an ongoing um, area of investigation to understand how can we modulate the, the cell conditions to um, produce desirable editing outcomes. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team behind this work, um, which is uh, not just at Stanford, but also uh, the, with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as our collaborators um, at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. And I'd like to thank LabRoots especially for hosting this uh, really useful conference and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question asks, why must guide RNA and donor DNA sequences remain physically linked throughout the cloning process? So that's an important question. So the guide, in many editing systems um, in different cell lines, the guide, the donor is supplied separately. And the reason why that wouldn't work in this case is because the guides and the donors are actually um, targeting different sequences. And because they're all in the same tube, if at any time during the cloning process they become detached or disassociated, they will all mix together with other guide and donor sequences, and it would result in uh, mispairing of a guide with an inappropriate donor that was supposed to be with a different guide. So this, this um, restriction makes it uh, very important that from the step of synthesis, the guide and the donor are always linked throughout this cloning process through to the internal cloning step here. Another question we have here is, what is the benefit of introducing a short barcode for the guide donor sequence at step one of cloning? So again, the one of the major concerns with using array-based synthesis is that the error rate can produce um, roughly 50% of the sequences that come off the array will contain a mutation. Um, some of those, some of those uh, synthesis errors will be in the guide sequence, some in the donor sequence. And when you're actually sequencing those regions with, with next generation sequencing, you also get sequencing errors. And so it's very difficult to distinguish sequencing errors from synthesis errors. So the barcodes essentially allow a unique molecular identifier for each guide and donor, and it allows us to align many different sequencing reads for a given guide donor barcode and gain a consensus sequence, which then allows us to assign synthesis errors or not to a given barcode. Thank you. This next question says, how long does the entire process take from cloning to phenotyping? So the, the cloning process is a multi-step process. And from the, the point of amplifying the library to cloning and transformation, it can take um, upwards of two weeks, assuming each step goes as desired. So it's important that after each step that the library is adequately covered. So you need many more transformants than library members, so roughly 20, in the range of 10 to 20 to 50x is ideal. 
to make sure that the library is not skewed or lost throughout this process. Okay, we have time for one more question. And this last one asks, what are the major hurdles to implementing Majestic in other organisms and human cell lines? So probably the, the biggest hurdle will be the prevalence of NHEJ as shown here. So as, as I showed with just by modifying the conditions of, um, of the yeast cell growth, we can actually favor homology-directed repair over NHEJ, and we can um, even favor it over cell death by utilizing the donor recruitment method. Other cell lines are very active in NHEJ, in particular human cell lines. And so it'll be very important to find strategies that both reduce NHEJ um, either genetically or transiently with small molecules um, in these other cell lines in order to in order to obtain an efficiency where, where a majestic-like approach could work in human cells. Um, we do think that it is a promising approach to use this the donor recruitment because uh, the process of recruiting proteins to a double-strand break is conserved and that adapting donor recruitment in other cell systems is really uh, a matter of finding what are the right partner proteins to bind the donor DNA. And so that's sort of, that's an ongoing um, work, but I, I think it will be possible if we can uh, address both the, the the NHEJ inhibition as well as increasing the efficiency of homology repair. I would like to once again thank Dr. Kevin Roy for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labrids for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2018. You will receive an email from Labrids letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.